So welcome to the next topic in IB chemistry, that of equilibrium, which will extend our knowledge uh, from IGCSE. And it can be broken into a uh, SL topic, equilibrium, kind of just going over and reinforcing the ideas we learned last year, and then uh, with higher level, the equilibrium law. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at the following things. We're going to state this. Uh, know that a state of equilibrium is reached in a closed system, okay, so that's dynamic equilibrium. Uh, that equilibrium law describes the, is described by an equilibrium constant that is unique for a particular chemical reaction. The size of an equilibrium constant is the extent of which the reaction at equilibrium and is temperature dependent. The reaction quotient is the measure of the relative amounts of products and reactants present during the reaction at a particular point of time. Q is the equilibrium expression with non-equilibrium concentrations, and it does change with concentration, pressure, and temperature. A catalyst has no effect on e equilibrium or its constant, and you should also know the characteristics of chemical and physical systems in a state of equilibrium. Uh, the three things that you should be able to do by the end of the unit are to be able to deduce the equilibrium constant expression for a particular homogeneous reaction, determine the relationship between different equilibrium constants, at the, or the same temperature at the same reaction, and apply the concept of the Chatier's principle. So, concentration change in a reaction. So, as the rate of reaction is dependent on the concentration of reactants, the forward reaction starts off very quickly because there's lots of reactants to react, and then slows as the reactants become products and therefore become less concentrated, less chance of successful collisions or the frequency of successful collisions. Okay, so fast at the start and slow at the end. And in an ordinary reaction, all reactants end up as products and there is a 100% conversion. So if you look at the, the Harbour process example, which you looked at uh, last year, you can see that the activation energy of the forward reaction and also the activation energy of the uh, backward reaction are larger compared to the activation energy of the forward reaction with a catalyst and the activation energy of the reverse reaction with a catalyst. You'll note also that the uh, reaction is an exothermic process. And looking at the red line, you can see that the activation energy for the overall process is going to be larger if there is no catalyst. But of course, with a catalyst, the backward and forward reactions are of the same rate. Because uh, even though the catalyst might speed up the reaction, it speeds up the reaction in both the forward and backward re uh, reaction at the same rate. So there's no effect on the equilibrium. So in terms of equilibrium reactions, Initially, there is no backward reaction because there are no products, but as the products begin to form, uh, this backward reaction begins to increase in its magnitude. And provided the temperature remains constant, there will become a time when the backward and forward reactions are both equal and opposite. The reaction has therefore reached equilibrium. Okay, so the rate of formation of the products is equaling the rate of formation of the reactants from the products. So in an equilibrium reaction, not all the reactants end up as products. There is not a 100% conversion of reactants into products. This, however, does not mean that the reaction is stuck somewhere in the middle, that the concentration of the reactants equals the concentration of the products. It depends on the reaction conditions and the reaction itself. And the reason before this is illustrated by the animations on the uh, right-hand side. At the start, the reaction is fastest in the forward direction because there obviously is no products being formed. But as the reaction continues on, then you've got products forming, so the forward reaction begins to slow down as there's not as many reactants to react, and the backward reaction starts to increase because now you've got products forming. Eventually it gets to a point at equilibrium when the backward and forward reactions are equal and opposite. So the important points to note are a reversal reaction is a dynamic process. Now what does that mean? That means everything might appear stationary at first sight, but the reactions are moving in both ways. Reactants are being formed into products at the same time that products are being formed into reactants. And although the position of equilibrium can be varied, this can only be done by changing the certain reaction conditions. Now the, the image 
you could probably use it to illustrate this is try to get up a down ask ladder and this gives an excellent idea of a non-chemical situation involving dynamic equilibrium okay so even though you're staying exactly where you are you are actually moving forward in a sense by trying to keep up with the down escalator. So in summary, when you've got chemical equilibrium, both the reactants and the products are present at all times. The equilibrium can be approached from either side and the reaction is dynamic. And when we say dynamic, it means it's both moving in the forward reaction and the backward reaction. And that rate is the same. And the concentrations of reactants then therefore remain constant. They might not be the same on both sides, but they will remain constant. They will, might not even be the same. So this brings us to the equilibrium constant Kc. And equilibria can be divided into two different groups. When all reactants and products are in one phase, the equilibrium is considered homogeneous. A homogeneous equilibrium is one which all of the reactants and products are present in a single solution. And reaction between solids, uh, or solutes and liquid solutions belongs to one type of homogeneous equilibria. The chemical species involved can be molecules, ions, or mixtures of both. So an example could be, you've got some ethine, okay, dissolved in some uh, solvent, okay. Uh, then you have uh, water being that solvent, and you add some aqueous bromine, you've then got an equilibrium with the associated um, alkane, okay, which is also dissolved in solution. And the other kind of equilibria is heterogeneous. Okay? A heterogeneous equilibrium is a system in which the reactants and products are found in two or more phases. The phases may be any combination of a solid, liquid, or gas, or even solution. But when dealing with these equilibria, remember that solids and pure liquids do not appear in equilibrium constant expressions, which we'll go into in more detail. Right, so here's an example here. Calcium carbonate, which is a solid, in equilibrium with calcium oxide, which is also a solid, and carbon dioxide, which is a gas. Obviously different phases, so it's going to be heterogeneous. So the equilibrium law simply states that if the concentrations of all the substances present at an equilibrium are raised to the power of the number of moles that they appear in at the equation, the product of the concentrations of the products divided by the product of the concentrations of the reactants is a constant, provided the temperature remains constant. That's quite a mouthful, you must agree. There are several forms of a constant, all vary with the temperature. So Kc, the equilibrium values are expressed in concentrations of moles per decimeter cubed. So what does it actually look like? So rather than using the definition, let's use some equations. Uh, for an equilibrium reaction of the form A moles of A plus B moles of B, giving C moles of C and D moles of D, that means that the, uh, the Kc, the equilibrium constant at common temperature, is going to be the following. Concentration of C to the power of a number of moles of C times the concentration of D to the power of a number of moles of D, divided by the concentration of A to the power of number of moles, concentrate, yeah, number of moles of A, times concentration of B times the number of moles of B. Where, of course, the square brackets denote the equilibrium concentration in moles per decimeter cubed, and Kc is known as the equilibrium constant. So the size or magnitude of Kc is also important. If Kc is very large, then the reaction goes to completion, essentially 100% products. Okay? which is, means it's much, much greater than 1. If Kc is very small, then the reaction would be considered to not occur at all because you've mostly got reactants. So if Kc is much, much less than 1. Okay, so this, this uh, diagram at the bottom here with the arrow illustrates that. Okay, so if Kc is very small, like 10 to the minus 6, equilibrium lies to the left, which favours the reactants. If Kc is very large, equilibrium lies to the right to favour the products, which makes sense when you think about it because that means that the, uh, the number at the top is very large and the number at the bottom is very low. This, this uh, introduces us to the concept of Le Chatelier's principle, where you begin to change this equilibrium constant by affecting certain things. When you change an apply, and the changes applied to a system in dynamic equilibrium, 
the system reacts in such a way to oppose the effect of the change. Okay, so here we have uh, solid A being heated to give a B gas. If you increase the heat, you increase B, also the amount of B, by decreasing A. If you decrease pressure, you increase B by decreasing A, and increasing A increases B to a decrease of A. So what does this look like? Well, here's a reaction, PCL5, a solid, in equilibrium with its two uh, reactant, uh, sorry, two products, PCL3, a liquid, and chlorine gas. And what happens if, and which is an endothermic process because it's positive. Okay, so what happens if we increase the concentration of the chlorine gas? Well, what's going to happen is it's going to push the reaction to the, I'll make it a little bit neater, uh, push the reaction towards the left, okay, towards creating more reactants. And it's going to basically increase the uh, rate of the reverse reaction uh, until equilibrium is met again, and then it's going to start decreasing again, and the forward reaction begins to kick in again. And this is exactly what we see in the graph, okay, you can see there that the uh, concentration of PCL5 increases, Concentration of chlorine decreases and the concentration of PCL3 uh, decreases as you would expect. And you can see there's a big spike in the rate of the reverse reaction in order to try and reach equilibrium again until the forward reaction begins to move again as it reaches equilibrium. And if you increase the temperature, okay, so it's an endothermic reaction, so increasing the temperature should favor the, the right hand side, okay? And again, that means that you'll end up uh, reducing the concentration of PCL5, which is exactly what we see, and the concentration of the products, PCL3 and chlorine, should increase. And again, the forward reaction begins to speed up in relation to the backward reaction until equilibrium is reached again, which is exactly what we see from the graphs. So factors that affect the position of the equilibrium, the first one is temperature. So temperature is the only thing that can change the value of the equilibrium constant. So the equilibrium constant is dependent on the temperature. If the temperature changes, then the equilibrium constant will be different. Altering the temperature affects both the rate of the forward and backward reactions and alters these rates to different extents. Therefore, the Kc will be different. Uh, the equilibrium thus moves, producing a new equilibrium constant, and the direction of the movement depends on the sign of the enthalpy change. So we saw that in the last example, okay, it was an endothermic reaction, and an increase in temperature moves things to the right. Uh, if it's an exothermic reaction, of course, delta H is negative, an increase in temperature will move the reaction to the left, okay, favoring the reactants, and a decrease in temperature will move to the right to favor the products. And as we just said, an endothermic positive delta H, uh, an increase in temperature will move it to face uh, form more products, as we saw. And a decrease in temperature will move it to the left to favor more reactants. So let's predict the effect of a temperature increase on the equilibrium position of the following reactions. Okay, so a hydrogen gas plus carbon dioxide given carbon monoxide and water. It's delta H is positive 40. Um, so that's going to be an endothermic process. If you increase the temperature, it's going to move to the right hand side. Okay, it's going to favor the products. As opposed to sulfur dioxide and oxygen, making sulfur uh, trioxide, an important component of acid rain development in, in clouds, that is a very exothermic process, believe me, oh boy, uh, making sulfuric acid. Um, so if you increase the temperature on that, then it's going to go the other way. It's going to favor formation of sulfur dioxide and oxygen. Another factor affecting the position of equilibrium, or does it, is catalysts. Catalysts work by providing an alternative reaction pathway involving a lower activation energy, as we saw in the last unit, okay? But they do not affect the equilibrium constant because obviously they're going to affect the forward and backward rate in the same way. So in terms of factors affecting the position of equilibrium, if you increase the concentration, it shifts to the opposite side. 
and the equilibrium constant does not change. You decrease concentration, it shifts to that side. Again, the equilibrium constant does not change. Increasing pressure and decreasing pressure will favour the side with, uh, well, increasing pressure will favour the one with least moles. Decreasing pressure will favour the one with most moles. Again, equilibrium constant does not change. The only thing that changes the equilibrium constant is the uh, increase or decrease of temperature. If you increase temperature, it shifts to the endothermic direction. If you shift uh, a decreased temperature, it's going to shift in the exothermic direction. And finally, as we just discussed in the previous slide, there's actually no effect on the equilibrium because it's basically changing the rate of both the forward and back reaction at the same, in the same way. So there's no change in Kc. So as an extra, why does pressure shift the equilibrium in a reaction? but not an equilibrium constant. So let's look at the born harbour process where nitrogen plus three moles of hydrogen give two moles of ammonia. That is, of course, the equilibrium constant expression. And the concentration of gas can be determined by the pressure of all the particles acting as a unit. So we can use partial pressures. So the partial pressure of A, uh, P uh, subscript A, is going to be equal to the mole fraction of A times the total pressure of the entire system. Or PA equals XA times P. So we end up, uh, from the equilibrium expression, developing the following um, formula, where um, the mole fraction of A, ammonia, squared, divided by the mole fraction of nitrogen, times the mole fraction of hydrogen, uh, cubed, times the partial pressure of hydrogen squared. So if we plug those numbers in, uh, you can see that at 10 atmospheres, the mole fraction is going to be uh, 0.15 of nitrogen, 0.45 of hydrogen, and of course, ammonia will be 0.4. If you increase the temperature of 300 atmospheres, you can see there's less nitrogen and less hydrogen, and it's going to favour forming more ammonia, which makes sense because uh, that means it's because there's three uh, moles on one side, the reactant side, and only two moles on the product side. However, if we plug the numbers in to the equilibrium constant, you can see that for 10 atmospheres, the equilibrium constant is about 0.12. And at 300 atmospheres, it's going to be equal to 0.15. So therefore, despite the increase in pressure, the equilibrium constant stayed the same uh, when you can take into consideration the graph uh, errors. And even though the equilibrium shifted dramatically to the right, okay, there's a doubling of the amount of ammonia. Okay, the, the equilibrium constant itself stayed pretty constant. So again, the harbour process, an exothermic process making ammonia. The conditions are high pressure, 300 to 200 atmospheres, a high temperature, 450 degrees Celsius, and catalyst being iron. So this is basically a combination of the two uh, topics that we've just done, or two units, uh, equilibrium and kinetic theory. Okay, so equilibrium theory favours low temperatures because it's an exothermic reaction, uh, so that way you get higher yield. Also favours high pressure because you've got four moles of reactants, two moles of product. It's going to favour the size side with the, the least number of uh, moles, the ammonia, the product side. However, kinetic theory favours high temperatures because you get greater average energy, more frequent successful collisions, okay? Um, higher pressure also favours frequent collisions for gaseous molecules, and a catalyst lowers the activation energy. Okay, so there's an energy consideration there. So in terms of the process, there's actually a compromise between kinetic and equilibrium theories. Uh, a low yield in a shorter time, basically, is uh, what happens if you follow the equilibrium theory, or you've got a high yield over a longer time, which is, I guess, a combination of kinetic theory and equilibrium theory. The conditions that are actually used in the harbour process are a compromise um, between these two theories, with the catalyst enabling a rate to be kept up even at lower temperatures. And this is the, the born harbour process there. Okay, so temperature and pressure of the reaction visual can be controlled. A mixture of ammonia condenses here. The ammonia can be removed, so again, that's probably favouring... Um, Equilibrium theory, because you're removing the reactants, it means it's going to favour creating more reactants. And the um, basically, uh, the hydrogen and nitrogen can be recycled as well, so you're again increasing the amount of reactants, again favouring the push to the, the right and creating more products.
So ammonia is used to make fertilizers, as you can see from the equations, making ammonium sulfate, and also making nitric acid. Okay, it can be oxidized into nitric acid. And nitric acid is used in the manufacture of both fertilizers, explosives, and polyamide polymers. In terms of combining equilibrium constants, if you reverse the reaction, so you've got a, a KC for uh, equilibrium constant for a forward reaction to get the uh, equilibrium constant for the back reaction, you will just have to invert the expression, put a, a reciprocal, one over the KC. If you double the reaction coefficients, okay, so now instead of having two moles, you've now got four moles, you square the expressions, okay. If you halve the reaction coefficients, you take the square root of the expression. And if you add two reactions together, so you've got A reacts to form B, and then B forms uh, reaction C, then you multiply the two expressions together. Uh, the final thing we're going to look at is Q, the reaction quotient. Uh, for a reaction, again, of uh, A moles of A plus B moles of B, going to C moles of C and D moles of D, then at least at constant temperature, because remember KC affects temperature, um, then again, the Kc at constant temperature will actually actually equal the reaction quotient. This is the same as the equilibrium constant, but the system is not necessarily in equilibrium with Q. Okay, because it could be a different temperature. So, uh, to finish off using Q, uh, chemically this can be used to determine if a reaction will actually occur, and in a physical sense can be used to determine if a salt will dissolve, for example. Okay, so if Q is greater than K, then the products are greater, therefore the reverse reaction is favoured. And if Q is equal to K, both reactions are occurring at equilibrium. And if Q is less than K, reactants are greater, the forward reaction is favoured. And that's pretty much all you need to know for at least SL equilibrium.